Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Canada School of Public Service. My name is Martin Green. I'm the Assistant Secretary to Cabinet for Intelligence Assessment at the Privy Council Office, and I will be your moderator for today's event entitled Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, and Foreign Intelligence. I'm pleased to be here with you today and want to welcome all of you who chose to connect to this event. I would like to acknowledge that since I'm broadcasting from Ottawa, I am in the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people. Today's event is the seventh installment of our Artificial Intelligence is Here series, which the Canada School offers in partnership with the Schwartz Riesman Institute for Technology and Society, a research and solutions hub based in the University of Toronto that is dedicated to ensuring that technologies like AI are safe, responsible, and harnessed for good. To date, this event series has covered topics that include the basics of AI, how and when to use it in government, economic impacts of AI, issues related to bias, fairness, and transparency, and the global effort to regulate AI. Today, we will be turning our attention to the role of AI and machine learning when it comes to foreign policy and intelligence. The format of the event will be as follows. First, we will watch a lecture featuring Janice Stein, a professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and who will discuss the potential for using AI and machine learning to inform foreign policy decision making. Following the lecture, Janice will join me live, along with our other guest panelist, John Lindsay, from the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at the Georgia Institute of Technology, for a panel discussion in which we will go more in depth on AI and foreign intelligence. Finally, we will have a bit of time near the end for audience questions, so please feel free to submit those questions at any point during today's event. To do so, please go to the top right corner of your screen and click the raise hand button and enter your question. The inbox will be monitored throughout the event. Before we play the lecture, please note that simultaneous interpretation is available for our participants joining us on the webcast. To access simultaneous French interpretation, please follow the instructions provided in the reminder email which includes a conference number that will allow you to listen to the event in the language of your choice. Without further ado, let's play the lecture. Intelligence is critical to the making of better policy decisions. It always has been. Today, I want to talk about how AI can improve intelligence and help to reduce the likelihood that decision makers will be surprised and make poor policy decisions as a result. What is intelligence? Intelligence estimates are predictions about the future. They're forecasts of what people will do or what a virus will do. Intelligence analysts use information about the past to make these predictions about the future. And these predictions inform decision makers' choices when they have to make hard calls among different options. Now, as recently as 100 years ago, all intelligence was exclusively human generated. Spies are as old as history and they sent back secret information about the capabilities or intentions of their adversaries. And analysts drew together the information they got from multiple sources and made predictions about the likely behavior of their adversaries in the future. That their predictions were sometimes right and sometimes wrong says little about their capabilities as analysts. Since information was always incomplete 
and predictions are always at best estimates with different degrees of probability. But over time, we've learned a great deal about how humans make decisions. And here's the surprise. The evidence is really strong that humans are limited in their cognitive capacity. All of us, to some degree or another, use cognitive patterns as shortcuts to save energy and cut through the complexity in our environment. And as a result, we make errors. Especially when we're making predictions, we often see the patterns that we expect to see. So what we've learned is that our capacity to predict is subject to systematic, not random error. So how then do we improve our capacity to predict? Well, we need help. The important first step to improve predictions is to draw on better data. In the last few decades, we've developed two different ways of improving prediction. The first method has been around for several decades. What do we do? We build models that make explicit the assumption we are using to predict these outcomes. And then we test the models against outcomes in the past and against whatever data we have in the present. One of the real values of models is we can exercise these models. We can vary the assumptions and we can see how a change in the assumptions will change the expected outcome. So modeling is very useful when we are trying to predict events that have two attributes. They're rare and they're complex. And we do a lot of that in global politics. I return to modeling later when I talk about the challenges of predicting the fall of Kabul to the Taliban in the summer of 2021. Almost nobody got it right. And that certainly qualified as an event that was both complex and uncommon. How could we do it better the next time? A second tool to improve predictions is artificial intelligence. And AIs can be trained to see patterns embedded in very large amounts of data that arrive really quickly from multiple sensors and multiple sources. And our world looks increasingly like that studded with sensors and drawing on multiple sources. There are patterns embedded in the large amounts of data that are flowing in now to intelligence analysts. But these human decision makers are unlikely on their own to uncover these patterns. Artificial intelligence can be a real help here. So artificial intelligence can be trained on these very large data sets. Their predictions then validated against another data set. And then here's what's really valuable. These predictions can be tested against new data so that analysts can see the error rate. That is really the promise of AI to improve intelligence. AI can generate predictions that can help decision makers make better decisions than they would without help. How might we use AI in global politics? There are many, many potential applications. And let me just talk quickly about six, but there are six of hundreds that I could identify. First, 
AI can help in the analysis of patterns in huge data sets of voice communications that intelligence agencies routinely collect from people abroad. These patterns can be very helpful in predicting what adversaries are likely to do. Analysis of metadata, the second one, metadata of who is talking to be whom can be helpful even when we have no access to the content of the conversation. This kind of analysis done with the help of an AI would allow the identification of networks that would otherwise be invisible to analysts. This kind of analysis is so powerful that in democracies, we put safeguards in place on the collection and analysis of these kinds of data because analysis of their patterns is so revealing. Here's a third area where AI can be helpful. It can help in the analysis of large volumes of financial flows across borders to track the funding of criminal and terror networks. Following the money is one of the most effective ways of identifying ransomware networks, as well as predicting illicit activities of criminal networks and drug smugglers. Fourth way, analyzing satellite data to track movements of people across borders to improve predictions of patterns of migration. Another one that we know has worked, analyzing web data and Google searches with an AI to predict the outbreaks of viral illness and demand for healthcare advice. Um, had we had that in place, the trajectory of the pandemic might have been quite different. And finally, analyzing transportation networks on land, at sea, and in the air, again, with the help of AI, would improve the predictions of critical disruptions in supply chains. We've seen how disruptive these breaks in supply chains can be. So what's the big challenge? to using AI and large data sets on all these big issues of global foes, we need large, accurate data sets. And that is still a work in progress. But improvements are coming very, very quickly. When I think about it, of course there are risks, but the benefits of AI to improving predictions in intelligence analysis are significant. And I compare it to what analysts would find if they were using only their naked eye. Now let's talk for a minute about the risk of harm. We all know that data sets will reflect the biases of the people who construct the training algorithms for the AI or even the data sets. If analysts are not aware of these biases, these predictions will simply reproduce these biases. And we already have considerable evidence of racial bias that is built into the AIs that were constructed to predict the likelihood of criminal reoffending. It is really important that we pay a great deal of attention to the implicit bias that is baked in to the data sets. Um, data sets can be biased not only by the inclusion of data, but also by the exclusion of specific kinds of data. And if these omissions are systematic, the predictions will be biased. Analysts and decision makers are often unaware of the limits of their data or the bias that is embedded in their data. When that happens, analysts especially 
will be overconfident in the predictions that they generate. And I know from research on decision-making that was poor, that overconfidence is one of the chief errors that analysts make. It is a trap uh, because they convey that overconfidence to the policymakers that they are advising. So as we move ahead in this field, which is changing dynamically in real time, we are already in the world of AI and intelligence. We need to pay extraordinary attention to the error rates of predictions and to the systemic biases in the data that are used to train AIs. All the while remembering that unaided human decision-making is biased as well, but we can't see it and it is harder to correct. Let me talk about a second tool that is especially useful for predicting rare and complex events. That tool is modeling. And let me illustrate the usefulness of modeling by retelling the story of the fall of Kabul in the summer of 2021. Certainly engraved in my memory are pictures of US aircraft taking off from Kabul airport with Afghans clinging to the underbelly of the planes in a desperate attempt to leave the country before the Taliban consolidated their power. The Taliban had advanced from the south of the country to the north in a rapid sweep, and within 10 days, took control of the capital city, Kabul, on August 15th, and cut off escape routes for Afghans who were trying to flee the city. If you saw those pictures, you probably asked, as did I, how could this evacuation have been so chaotic, disorganized, and frankly, shambolic? The answer that came back from US officials when they were asked is, we were surprised. They said that they had asked their intelligence agencies and were told, that yes, the Taliban would take over Afghanistan, but not quickly. One large agency predicted that the current government, the government of President Ashraf Ghani, would stay in power for at least two years after the US withdrawal. Another agency predicted that the Afghan government would survive for at least a year after US forces withdrew. Those intelligence estimates were updated in early August by all the big agencies. The president asked, the new prediction, the Afghan government might fall by the end of 2021. So there were disagreements within the intelligence community, but all of the agencies that were advising President Biden agreed. There was time, at least several months. So the president made a critical decision. He agreed to President Ghani's request not to start the evacuation because that would undermine confidence in the staying power of the Afghan government. Now, what happened here in this story? Predictions drove decisions as they almost always do. Now, was it different in Canada, where we might think intelligence analysts were less motivated to be optimistic, they had less skin in the game? After all, we in Canada had no troops on the ground. We had withdrawn our forces in 2014. But what we did have were thousands of interpreters who had helped the Canadian Armed Forces 
and in so doing put their lives and their lives of their families at risk were the Taliban to take over. And we had fixers who worked with Canadian journalists and also put their lives at risk and who had helped Canadian NGOs. So were the predictions of Canadian intelligence any better? It seems not now. It's true that we in Canada get much of our intelligence data and analysis directly from the United States. It's also true that we had limited independent capacity to collect and interpret intelligence on the ground in Afghanistan. Nevertheless, as one of our senior deputies said, we were surprised. We thought we would have time to organize an evacuation of all the Afghans who had helped Canadians. We didn't have time. And so we left behind hundreds, if not thousands of Afghans who had risked their lives for Canada. Many hid in safe houses for months, waiting for help that was now much harder to provide. And IRCC, our Immigration and Refugee Agency, was swamped by the imperative to process thousands of files by people who were stranded outside Canada, desperate for help, yet these people had to be examined as potential security risks. Better predictive analytics would have made a huge difference. But the real challenge was better prediction on when the Taliban were likely to take over Kabul. Predicting when is much harder than predicting whether an event will happen. This kind of forecast is really hard. We have very limited data to train an AI, even if we could draw on all the available historical cases, and many of those cases would not have been relevant because the context was so different. So what could we have done in early August in the face of uncertainty and the need to generate predictions to inform time urgent decisions. We could have built a model. Making explicit the assumptions of the factors that would drive the return of the Taliban. And in advance, specify the indicators of each of these factors so intelligence analysts would have known what to look for. We could then have fed that model on an hourly basis, data relevant to the indicators of those factors, data like the location of the Taliban forces, their distance from the capital, road conditions, their methods of transportation, where Afghan special forces were deployed and where they were stretched, and the rate of the Taliban advance. Using assumptions about the Taliban's preferences, we could have asked the model to predict the pace of the Taliban advance. And then we could have asked the model to update the predictions as new data were generated. The first two provinces in the north of Afghanistan the heartland of traditional resistance to the Taliban fell with no fighting whatsoever on August the 5th. How diagnostic were these indicators? Well, to me, they were very diagnostic. And I said quietly to myself, the fall of Kabul is coming imminently. Had our agencies treated these variables as diagnostic, based on an argument that we could have had beforehand about how important they were, we could have had aircraft on the ground in Kabul a week before 
the Taliban took control of the city. Many of the Afghans to whom we were and are obligated could have been safely evacuated. Time really mattered, and it is accurate prediction that gives decision makers time. In this really difficult case, models working to test assumptions and human judgment working together could have improved predictions. When we think about how a model could have helped to predict the fall of Kabul, we needed to compare it to human decision-making that is also biased. That is always the default. The question is not whether we have a perfect model or whether we have a perfect AI, but how do these compare to human decision-making that is often also flawed for reasons that we know? So here's why building a model helps. We're forced to make our assumptions explicit. And we're forced to do that in some kinds of AI as well. That is a powerful debiasing tool. We can test alternative assumptions against the data that we have. Considering alternative assumptions is another debiasing tool. If it wasn't the rate of the Taliban advance, well, were there certain provinces that if they fell, told us that the fall of Kabul would be likely? Alternative models can generate a range of predictions, each expressed with varying level of confidence to decision makers. Broadening what analysts can say to policymakers, expressing contingency, and alerting them to the ranges is so valuable to decision makers who have to make these decisions. At best, in a world of probability, but more often in a world of uncertainty, and make these decisions with really grave consequences. So let's go back for a moment and put ourselves in the position of decision makers in Ottawa between August the 5th and 15th. Ministers had to choose between starting up an evacuation immediately and undermining confidence in the Afghan government or waiting and risking that an evacuation would be rushed and put at risk many Afghans who had been on an application list for years. Which harm would you have advised our government to minimize? What evidence would you use? What would you have based your prediction on? I'm going to leave that one with you. Let's consider a second problem of prediction where AI could really have helped. After that frantic evacuation, Afghans who had risked their lives for Canada were dispersed throughout the city of Kabul. Could AI have helped our officials to generate predictions rapidly within a 48 hour period? that they could have used to identify and provide documents and visas to Afghans who claimed they had helped Canadians. Many Afghans had applied years before to come to Canada, but processing was very slow. And those Afghans who congregated at the gates of the airport needed one document, a visa from Canada, before they could get into the airport. Could AI have helped us here? Here, large data sets are available of past immigrations or could easily have been constructed. An AI could have been trained on a data set of refugees that Canada had accepted from war torn countries and those that had been rejected. A validation set could have been constructed 
on refugees from other countries. Smart analysts could have paid real attention to the biases that might have been built in to those data sets. And then the AI could have been run against a test set and its error rate established. It's almost inevitable that the predictions generated by the AI would have reflected some of the biases of previous decision makers. But at least the decision makers in IRCC would have known in advance something about the biases and more about the error rate. So back again to the real policy problem that officials faced. If they'd had predictions generated that way, they could have traded off the error rate against the two-year human-generated delays in issuing visas that failed to reach many of the Afghans in time to be evacuated. What was the cost of those delays? Well, Afghans who congregated at the gates of Kabul airport, but who did not have visas from Canada were turned back. Virtually everybody who was turned back is now at considerable risk. Funding for safe houses has run out and there are Afghans stranded inside the country as well as around the world as they await Canadian visas. It's very likely that officials who are working overtime now to process these files are nevertheless making errors that all human beings make. We all make those mistakes, so that is not a, in any way a criticism of our officials. But when humans make unaided decisions, we can't calculate those errors with any degree of accuracy, nor can we examine the biases. So think of the policy problem this way. We could have trained an AI to generate lists of Afghans that could be evacuated on a time urgent basis. And here we would be using AI to improve efficiency, knowing that we were gonna sacrifice some accuracy because of the imperatives for quick action. The alternative not to generate any lists because of the short time available and the complex data requirements and the risk of error, which is a major factor for human decision makers, resulted in stranding many Afghans with no access to help. How would you weigh the relative harms and benefits, and what would you advise the minister? In summary, good intelligence is absolutely critical to decision-making. It always has been, and it is becoming more and more so. Intelligence is fundamentally a prediction problem. AI and models can each help with prediction although they do it in different ways. And they're each suited to different kinds of policy problems. We can know the error rate of their predictions. We rarely know our own error rate. We pay a great deal of attention to the systematic biases created by an AI, but far less to the systematic biases that all human decision makers have. So what are the challenges that we face as we move into a world of AI generated intelligence? How best to combine the benefits of human and artificial intelligence to improve predictions that are essential to better policy? When do we use AI to improve accuracy, and when do we use it to improve efficiency? And how do we trade these two off? 
what kinds of prediction problems are best suited to AI, and what kind are best handled by models that manipulate assumptions explicitly. In the next few years, we will learn more and get better at meeting these challenges, but we are already in the world of AI, models, and intelligence. Thank you. Well, thank you, Janice, for that uh, marvelous video. Um, I'd like to introduce our two uh, guest speakers for this afternoon. Uh, we're privileged to have Janice Stein, Professor, Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management, Department of Political Science, University of Toronto. And we also have with us from Atlanta, John Lindsay, Associate Professor, the School of Cybersecurity and Privacy, Sam Nunn School of National Affairs at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, I'd like to remind folks that you can uh, submit questions. We're going to have a few uh, brief um, uh, chats with our guest, and then we're gonna go to Q's and A's. So to do so, you need to use the top right uh, corner of your screen, click the raise hand button and enter your question. Uh, so pl please feel free to do that. And the second part of this hour will be devoted to um, your questions. So to kick off uh, on the panel discussion, uh, people have been talking about AI for a number of years, um, lots of coverage, how we're on the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution, or indeed in it. Um, and I was wondering if I could ask both of you for your thought, sort of contextually, on where we're at. Um, is AI really differentiating um, right now from the more traditional intelligence collection approaches? Where are we at in the use of these technologies? Are they still considered nascent or are we well down the road? And this is to provide some context for folks about where this fourth industrial revolution may or may not be at. I thought I would ask you, Professor Lindsay, if you, uh, you wouldn't mind starting off. Absolutely. So no, there's no shortage of documents from the United States, from European countries, certainly from China, that paint uh, AI as the new uh, silver bullet for competition, whether that be in the economic realm or the military realm. Uh, this idea that this transformation and the ability to uh, analyze and predict data is going to lead to kind of wholesale reforms in national competitiveness. Um, and maybe that's especially in the military realm, right? Um, and there's no shortage of kind of science fiction prompts to, to get us thinking in that way. Um, of course, the reality is far more complex. The context, as you mentioned, is far more complex. And I think it's important to understand this thing that we're calling the fourth industrial revolution in terms of a much longer process of switching um, physical labor and physical activity and human in, in building and doing things to uh, more cognitive activities. Um, and before you even start thinking about what the machines may be doing in the cognitive realm, we have lots of people that are doing what looks more like office work rather than factory work, uh, that are working in headquarters rather than uh, fighting on the battlefield. And that's been a long-term trend that really isn't about AI. And that creates these incredible information management challenges. So I think some of the excitement about AI is kind of just recognizing the difficulty of this informationally dense and interpretively challenged environment that exists for, for firms, for militaries, and for our intelligence agencies, and this perennial hope that there will be a technological solution for it. But I think rather than really seeing a fourth revolution, we're seeing a continuation of the same process, which means that humans and 
technology are having to deal with increasingly complex problems and having to sort through uh, a lot of the problems that those very solutions will create in the process. So I, I might just add, Mark, with what Ron just said, if we move out along the frontier into science fiction, the most interesting science fiction right now is about what we call AGIs, Artificial General Intelligence. And that's what's gripping the popular imagination. Are we humans about to be replaced entirely by machines? And that's way, way, way out at the end of the frontier. Uh, I think, uh, and, and how close are we to that uh, is what we hang around coffee machines uh, talking about all the time. I think uh, it might be useful to make a distinction here, and it'd be interesting, John, to hear what you think about this. Uh, one is this argument about replacing human cognition with machine cognition, because that's what artificial intelligence is, really advanced capacity. Um, to uh, process enormous amounts of data and to derive patterns from that data. And then let me add a loaded word here, which we don't know what it means, believe it or not. After 2,000 years, we still don't know. And learn, because that's the critical word in there. And we do not have a consensus in neuroscience, cognitive science, philosophy, or artificial intelligence on what that one word means. Uh, because that, but that's what machines would have to be able to do. They would have to have an autonomous capacity to learn in order to replace us. And then there's the much more, as John suggested, pragmatic approach, which machines are going to help us do a lot of the things that we do. They're augmenters. And so AI will augment. We don't have to look very far uh, when we pick up our smartphone, mine is already sent me a message about something because it's figured out by pattern recognition that I'm interested. Even worse, my espresso machine at home, I just had to buy a new one because my old beloved one imploded and this one is a smart espresso machine. So there are 12 drinks on the machine. I've only used it for three days. It knows that I only want that one and the other 11 have now disappeared from the display board. Um, so is that machine thinking? <laughs> is it doing really smart pattern recognition? But it's an example of AI in everyday life. So from that perspective, we're, it's here. It, we're not, it's not a process, it's here. It's been here for a long time uh, and it's getting better and better and better at pattern recognition all the time. That still lives a big, huge question. <laughs> Can it learn? That's the big one. And we don't have an answer to that. Well, you know, some of the AI stuff out there is very polite. I know that I yell at my voice command on my television on occasion when it doesn't do what I want. Uh um, and it's unfailingly polite in its response. It's sort of, I don't understand, Martin. Did you want to do something else? Um, in my job, um, we do we do a lot of work on AI just as a subject, you know, what country's doing what, where the technology's at. And sadly, um, you know, one of the things that quickly becomes apparent is all of the opportunities, um, AI and health services, AI and social services, you know, the opportunity is endless. Um, so too is the dark side uh, on all of this in terms of uh, what some of these technologies can be used for. And I'd like to ask both of you uh, in terms of your uh, studies on this, where do you think the major sort of policy debates are going to be around the use of AI? Um, we know that authoritarian countries, given their command and control, and I would suggest lack of restraint, um, are able to use some of the newer technologies, including AI, basically for suppression um, or to get rid of dissent uh, on the dark side. But in terms of, I guess, you know, the West, for lack of a better word, um, and especially Canada, 
Where do you see some of these key policy debates uh, with respect to the application of AI? Did you did you want to start again, John, or is over to you, John? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I think there's kind of you know, four big areas, and they certainly pop out when you're looking at the authoritarian countries. I mean, China's interested in AI because it wants to make money, and it sees that this is a huge emerging market. Um, it wants to, um, you know, have a more effective censorship and information control regime, and that's one uh, certain a place where it can uh, use it. It wants to have, uh, you know, a more modern and effective military force, and so. Um, throughout the last 20 years, the Chinese were talking about informatization. Now they're talking about intelligentization, journal thought, sounds better in Chinese, right? Um, and uh, that makes a lot of sense for China because China wants to build a military that looks a lot like Western militaries that are very high tech, very networked, um, but they run on people that are very highly educated and have a lot of initiative to go and do things. And that's a little bit scary for the Chinese People's Liberation Army, right? Because if you've got really smart, highly educated people with lots of initiative, how do you know that they're loyal? So if you could replace that loyalty problem with AI, maybe you could get military effectiveness and you know, loyalty to the regime. And that solves the coup proofing problem that, you know, um, I, th I think we're seeing on display in Russia right now, quite frankly, right? I mean, like, you know, an abysmally, you know, effective military, um, but one that has been made loyal. So, you know, maybe that's that's a win domestically. Um, I digress. And then and then the fourth, um, you know, bucket is, is your world, right? The world of intelligence, right? Trying to uh, make sense of this mass of, of information. Um, and I think there are some, some serious challenges there as, as well. So, you know, you can drill down to all four of these categories, but I think one thing I want to emphasize is that in the kind of economic and political history in all of these areas, whether we're looking at economics, kind of institutions, military power, intelligence, the key thing that determines the effectiveness of technology is not the technology itself, not whatever it substitutes for, but the complements, right? The organizational skills and the human capacity that that country or that firm can mobilize to get the most out of its technology. So I would suggest that when we're kind of looking and comparing um, you know, what North America can do with what China can do or Europe, right? Um, we need to be doing that full net assessment and looking not just at the technological substitutes, but those super, super vital human compliments. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that John has made, that if we isolate technology from the organizational context and the larger systems uh, in which um, it's embedded, um, that's really a problem. That is really a problem. We're gonna get the analysis uh, really badly wrong. Um, on the other hand, let me just drill down at the other end of the spectrum for one minute, just to make a point that doesn't get made often enough when we look at the challenges of AI. Um, one of the problems is, um, and this is the most frequently cited challenge in the literature, um, AI is biased. <laughs> now, why is it biased? And that's very, and it's a really interesting conversation because, and there's huge amounts of evidence here. Uh, and I just saw um, a really interesting piece um, on, the, on the AIs that come out of uh, DeepMind. Um, and it's because DeepMind scrapes the whole of the web and gathers it up in, you know, massive amounts of data. But then, of course, what it doesn't take into account, how much junk <laughs> is on the web and how much bias is reflected on what's on the web. And all that's scooped up and incorporated and is used to train AIs. And so, you, you know, the old expression, garbage in, garbage out, well, you get bias in, bias out. But what this whole argument misses <laughs> is you left me with the problem. Um, you get biased, too. Because every single one of us brings bias, unconscious bias for sure, and sometimes conscious bias. And the real problem is with the unconscious bias. And there isn't a human being. There's no exception to that rule. 
there's and every one of us has unconscious bias because we have scripts, cognitive scripts that we develop to manage the problem that John talked about, huge amounts of information. Our cognitive processing would break down if we did not have these scripts. Um, but we don't think about our own bias when we, for, when we, when an analyst in your shop, Martin, um, provides a piece of analytic work. So our conversation, if I think about it as seesaw, it's tilted this way. And all the bias is on the side of the AI and none of it's on the human side. And that's just a completely inaccurate <laughs> discussion to have. And every time, I, so my concern is not that we shouldn't be worried about bias in AI, but it's a much bigger concern. We need to be worried about unconscious bias in all human information processing, whether augmented or not. And when we put the problem that way, that's, I think, a better context for thinking about AI. Thanks. It's, um, it's interesting. You know, the bias conversation is very interesting. Um, in the lead up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, you know, it was pretty obvious to everybody who was reading the newspapers that the United States um, uh, allow, you know, in an unprecedented fashion, uh, gave some of its more exquisite intelligence um, uh, to the public domain um, because it was pretty much indicating that the invasion was coming, but a whole bunch of people, including myself, have this optimism bias, which was, no, he's never going to do this. Like, it's wrong. Um, and actually, it was one of those times when my analysts were telling me, um, you know, get your act together, Martin. Uh, and it's very, you know, as a human being, it's very hard to see. Um, and I still have those moments when of complete disbelief in what we're seeing. I also remember that, you know, and it fits in what you were saying, Professor Lindsay, is, um, you know, the biggest ingredients in innovation in any, any country are basically demographics, technology, and the skills of people. And the more that I'm looking at AI, everybody is saying the foundation piece of this has got to be people and their talent. Um, if you really want to, you know, have um, AI that produces social benefits. But one of the things that we're also seeing that I alluded to, and I'm wondering how Western governments, you know, get around this or if it's sustainable. We believe in a free and open internet. Um, you know, we have charters of rights, uh, privacy laws, um, all of this. And one of the things about AI is the more data you can get, the more data on your citizens, um, and the better that data is, the better your AI, you know, could you know, the better the results that the AI may produce for you. So do you think it's sustainable, you know, in the US and Canada in the, in the West, um, that we have, I guess, what is slightly a laissez-faire approach to the internet and how AI is used, or do you think we're going to have to intervene more? Well, I mean, I think we already have plenty of intervention going on. I mean, you know, data doesn't just produce itself. It produces itself because, you know, people in societies and firms want it that way. And if people start to get upset, then you get, you know, more privacy restrictions and comprehensive regulation like you have in uh, Europe. And now, you know, for the first time ever, we're now seeing the NSA in the United States is going to have to have a FOIA-like process where it will review European complaints about surveillance, right? I mean, like, th this has never happened. You've had an American intelligence agency that's now going to be shaped by foreign laws that the Congress hasn't ratified, but that's the price of making sure that Facebook and Google get to do business in in uh, in Europe. So, you know, I think that this is a really, really live debate that we're going to continue to see. Um, and you know, and it and it's not the case that that simply more information makes AI better. I mean, you know, I, I think the days of information wants to be free and we'll all get more you know, educated and smart on the internet. Like, that's, those are long gone. Um, uh, 
we we see a lot of noise and it's only going to be in these particular applications where you can say okay this is the data that we have on a problem that we can understand we understand where the data is coming from um and now right you can okay so like take uber lyft right this several kinds of data there's all the data that goes into making live traffic maps there's all the data that goes into ridership patterns and there's kind of this massive consensus amongst people that build maps, use maps, use roadways, you know, want to get from place A to point, point B at, you know, an efficient way. Like everybody can kind of understand what they want to do and what a solid performance of the AI supporting this is going to look like. So you end up getting in this really well institutionalized environment, a really nice niche kind of route predictor and price predictor set of AI applications to support that Uber application. Um, you know, that's not a general purpose AI that you can just stick out somewhere else, nor would you necessarily want to dump a bunch of other extraneous, you know, information um, that, that wasn't totally relevant to, to that prediction. So I think when we kind of think about like needing more data, it's data about what it's never going to be unbiased. It's going to be a bias that's useful for the kind of application that you know that firm and that society has decided that that it wants to engage in. If that makes sense. You know what? Just to elaborate on on what John just said, um, we think back to the early days of computers, <laughs> you, and there were cards, punch hole cards. That's where the, the sector really started. There's all kinds of quality control. Right, because you knew no matter what, there was error. And in order to get reliable outputs, you had to control the quality of the inputs. I think that's where we're going with AI too. And that's really the, the import of your remarks, John, that we're no, it's not about hoovering up massive amounts of data about your citizens, because you're going to get a lot of garbage. And you know you're going to get a lot of garbage. And it's, so it's not going to be that useful to you. It's going to become more refined. Um, you're going to have a more precise definition of what you want to do, Martin. And then there's going to be a big investment in the quality of the data that goes in. Because you're not going to get very smart AIs if you don't have really, if you don't have quality control around the data that's going in. So, you know, that, that project that I talked about that hoovered up this massive amount of data from the web produced garbage. And that's what they found out. Well, good. <laughs> so there's a lot of hype around mass surveillance, frankly. This is really wasteful <laughs> and expensive and doesn't give you the kind of results you want. There's another gem in John's remarks there that's worth thinking about for a minute. Um, which is the role of European regulation of, of data standards, um, and with, particularly with respect to privacy. And it's really interesting because there are no big European companies. They're not in the top 20. There's two, and they're way down, 18, 19. The rest are all Chinese and American, which really tells you something <laughs> about the Europe of the last 20 years. There's Nokia, there's Ericsson, but boy, it's a small number and totally dis disproportionately small, given the European industrial marketplace. It, it's a really bad performance. Now, the French are just beginning now. We're at the very early days where the French may uh, begin to agglomerate enough. So how is it that Europe is able to export its data standards and Facebook and Google comply? Well, they comply because it's just more efficient that one standard and to conform to that one standard and you treat the whole world as a global market. Now, so that's what gives Europe the power to regulate even though it has no horses in the race, frankly. How long is that true? I think that's the bigger question. Do we have, are we free well at the end of a single internet? Are we at the verge? at the verge of a divided internet, a fragmented internet, where there are, it's really difficult, the firewalls grow, uh, the sh spaces shrink, and when the spaces shrink, does Europe lose some of that leverage to set standards um, in a much smaller 
internet than the one that we currently have now. It just uh, way out speculation about where we're going in the future, but it's something that some of us think about now. That's a, a perfect segue to sort of a third per, part here, which is uh, I would mention that right now, half the world's leading AI experts work for American companies, and the US attracts the majority of high quality foreign talent. Canada is no slouch uh, in this regard. We ranked fourth globally in attracting high quality talent yeah. um, in 2017. So we are, um, uh, we're a strong niche player in this game, just, just so folks know. In terms of, um, one of the questions about this are the impacts of AI technology uh, on geopolitics. Um, there, um, it, we've seen uh, a lot of debate re uh, recently um, that the U.S. is very, um, you know, upset um, with the Chinese for investing in reverse engineering, stealing um, uh, U.S. patents, technology. The same here in Canada. Um, and there have been lots of chats about uh, bifurcating, decoupling um, these extraordinarily complex supply chain systems. But I was wondering if I could ask both of you to offer some thoughts with respect to the geopolitics. A lot of folks are talking about, you know, there's three centers um, of technology right now. One is China, two is uh, the US, and three is Europe. Um, as you know, the major players, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on where this is going geopolitically. John, <laughs> um, just in a sentence or two. <laughs> just, just in a sentence or two. Um, I, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. You know, decouple from, <laughs> decouple from the, the geopolitical question from the, the AI question. Um, you know, obviously, this is not a new Cold War that we're entering in. This is something totally different, right? This is not nuclear superpower bipolarity. Um, there are multiple centers. You've got simultaneous competition on multiple dimensions with an unprecedented degree of integration. And even if there will be a little bit of decoupling in some areas, like that integration is can continue to be the theme and we'll watch it ebb and flow in a, a couple of different areas. And so how do you compete while you're cooperating or how do you cooperate while you're compete, right? Like those, that's gonna be the overarching theme that we're gonna to continue to try and deal with. And I think it puts a huge tension on the AI question because on the one hand, you're like, oh my gosh, China or whoever um, you know, is gonna have the AI thing that's going to uh, enhance their military power and allow them to um, overcome a lot of their deficits. Well, that's kind of a classic, let's look at the power of individual countries as they you know, impact others. But if what makes AI really useful is access to a lot of this data that is shared to you know, a high degree um, and you know, involves kind of more collective problems, then you know you need some degree of integration to even make that you know data possible and and available. So so while we have these important kind of geopolitical trends, don't expect any kind of sharp rupture because you're still going to be stuck in this interesting kind of superposition between cooperation and and competition. And I think AI just really really you know it's almost the poster child for that because it works when it works well. It works because there is an institutional structure for it, right? I gave the Uber, you know, self-driving example, right? Like that is kind of a stable economy where everybody kind of agrees this is generally something we, you know, want to have happen. And the military situations are the exact opposite, right? The data is terrible. The judgments are controversial, right? Really, really hard to find things for AI to do other than like really, really niche, you know, applications. Um, and so if we're looking at emerging multipolarity, so multiple centers, in a heavily interdependent world, you kind of have both of those things going on. And so I think it's going to make AI very attractive, but also really, really hard to operationalize. I, I'm going to, I agree with everything John said. I'm just going to make a really provocative comment now. 
um, about one tiny piece of your question, Martin, um, which is when you opened up the question and you said there's a history of um, thievery of intellectual property where China is concerned. And that's certainly been a dominant trope. And we in Canada have passed um, regulations in order to deal with that problem. I think that it is probably going to prove to be one of our biggest own goals. And why is that? Because the story of China uh, is behind <laughs> and sending its graduate students and its faculty to the West to steal intellectual property. And you don't have, you can just do it by being present, right? Because you walk out of the lab and the ideas are in your head. Um, that story is old and outdated. And consistent with what John just said, we should be sending our faculty and our graduate students to China, to its best universities, to learn so that we can catch up and be as good in some very important areas where China is now in the lead. So this kind of visceral reflex, <laughs> keep people out, um, might have been a story that would have worked 20 years ago. It is a self-defeating strategy uh, for a country like Canada uh, to take into the 2020s, that is for sure. I know there is almost nobody in the Canadian government who agrees with me on this, um, but if we say it often enough and loud enough, it may begin to make some sense to people who are actually have deep knowledge of what China is doing in some areas. And that's where John is so right, because this is such a differentiated story. And you have to know uh, some areas of AI and some areas of quantum um, where China has made both massive investments and really significant advances. So we have to let go of the story that 20 years ago past its best before date is all I could say. Um, I certainly agree with the part about having more Canadian students study in China. Um, you know, I think, I, as I recall, the numbers about five years ago, there were 150 some odd thousand Chinese students studying here, a lot in post-grad. I think we had 13 or 1500 studying in China. Um, you know, so if you do want to um, work with and, um, you know, profit from the biggest economic center of gravity, it probably makes sense that we know more about it. As for the rest of the trope, we will discuss that at some other time, um, because uh, there are a lot of things going on, and we have put um, some safeguards in place. We're at the juncture where we get to go to Q's and A's from the audience, and a number have popped up. Um, one of the ones um, that I'm going to use, you know, my perch as moderator, uh, and it's something I wondered, you know, about myself and my analysts are always asking. Um, in terms of AI, um, and we have a bird, you know, a a growing intelligence analyst community at the federal level, foreign service officers, um, a number of who collect uh, foreign intelligence. As we're moving towards perhaps a more technology-driven future, which includes AI, what would you counsel um, young public servants to do with respect to preparing themselves for a newer world? read about the older world. I mean, I think the more that you can learn about history and human nature um, and, you know, what states and state leaders actually want, um, the better off you're going to be. Because again, you know, the, you know, AI will help you identify, is that a tank? Is that a ship? Like, what do the migration and refugee patterns look like? And all of that's really, really useful to inform your assessment. But when it really, really comes down to, like, what is that dictator going to settle for or when are they going to negotiate right like that's going to come down to these basic questions of you know fear wealth status and all the thucydian you know concepts um and those are issues of, of value judgment goals you know objectives uh stakes 
And I think the more that we, you know, automate kind of what human beings do, the things the machines don't do, which are kind of these moral and intellectual qualities become really, really, really more important. So like the comparative advantage of analysts are going to be understanding, you know, the nature of human beings and human societies. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I might add just one more um, because let's put AI uh, in the queue of a long wave of technologies that come on board and improve our capacities uh, to understand and to analyze problems. So when we use these technologies, there's always a risk um, of blind mysticism that we think, <laughs> you know, and I can remember going back, and this is a very long time ago to my graduate school days when I learned a new statistical technique, and while it was magic, right? It just produced a result. And there's a tendency to believe the result because there's this magic that's happening. Well, technology is never magic. And I think John and I, and you, Martin, have said in so many different ways this afternoon that what is really important is to understand the quality of the data that is going into any technology uh, whose results you use. And just to take that step back as an analyst and ask those hard questions, what kind of data? <laughs> Yeah. Right? What kind of data informed this analysis? Uh, what did you do to the data? To sort of have not a capacity to do it yourself. That's not, you don't need that. Uh, because that, that's, you know, we're never going to be as skilled as the people who do it full time. But a capacity to ask the hard question about quality um, and, and bring skepticism always bring skepticism to the result of any analysis that you don't understand. You know, it, it makes me think just for a minute of derivative analysis and a CEO who said, no, no, I'm not doing that in my bank. And they asked him why, and he says, because I don't understand it. And I'm not going to sign on to anything I understand. And he was one of the few <laughs> whose bank survived 2007, 2009 without very serious consequences. So bring your wits to the game, bring your skepticism, bring your own intelligence and ask hard questions about the quality of work that you're getting. And that never changes. It doesn't matter what the technology is. I think maybe if I could add one more practical piece of advice, and this is something you could easily implement. I think if you're interested in AI, come down out of the stratosphere from the big kind of debates about AI competitiveness and go look at one particular AI system in use and just kind of look at the difficulties that people encounter. So I have a neighbor who works in computer vision. He's got this company, right? And he's trying to put together this system that will like just sit there and stare at beer cans going by on the supply line and identify when one of the beer cans has been crushed because you want to pull that off the line. And right now, like humans will come and spot check the beer cans and you know you miss most, most of them. And so a bunch of them end up going through. So like, this seems like a perfect AI application super stable, all the beer cans are stabilized, it's on a mass produced line, all it has to do is look and then go like, bing, and you would not believe how hard this problem is. Beer cans that look the same are not the same, like they're rotated slightly different, they've got beads of sweat, the lighting gets all funky, another machines are like suddenly glinting all over the place. And so the amount of tweaking to solve the easiest possible computer vision problem is I think just useful to understand, okay, now you wanna scale this up to, you know, doing a national intelligence estimate, give me a break, right? So, so kind of immerse yourself at the lowest, lowest level to understand how a couple of these systems work and then go back up with that knowledge and start to think about, okay, how is China really gonna implement this? Like, how is it really gonna work? And I think it will be, Revelation. That's really, uh, I think that's great advice. Um, we have a number of questions in um, from the audience. Um, I thought I would start with this one. Do the panelists think that decision makers don't trust 
AI as much as traditional intelligence collecting. In brackets, in flying, the rule is to always trust your instruments over your judgment. I, I love this question because, you know, in, in all of the debates over lethal autonomous weapon system, right, the concern is like, oh, my God, you're going to give Terminator the authority to start killing human beings. This is terrible. We need to have a human being in a loop. Um, and sometimes the question is, well, why do you trust Sergeant Smuckatelli more than the machine, right? You can end up with Srebrenica or Mylai or any of these terrible human makings that like the machine would probably say, no, this is obviously illegal. This is not a good idea. We're not going to do this. Um, you know, this is not a situation that, that I want to be in. So, you know, there may be situations where turning things over to the machines may give you more predictable results, but um, we don't want to do that because we have this more romantic notion of what, what humans could, could bring to it. So, so I, I love the spirit of, of the question. Um, but again, I, I think, I think it comes down to what is the specific thing that you're trying to solve? Like instruments on an airplane work because we understand the environment that they're in, the physical principles on what they're operating, what they're actually sensing, right? How far above the ground you are, which way the wind's blowing. That's great. You've got a fairly stable problem and you've got a solution that is super um, harmonized with it. And most of the Intel problems you're looking at are not that at all. It is a messy, noisy, difficult problem. And you have made all of these kind of biased assumptions about what you're looking on. And you need to have somebody that is smart about both the problem and the solution to kind of mitigate that gap. And let's just push this, this analogy one step further. Let's go back. How many passengers would be okay if they heard announced, buckle your seatbelt, and an AI is flying you today from Toronto to Atlanta? There was no pilot aboard this plane. They would not be happy at all. But what do the data tell us? 97 point something of crashes are human error. They're not machine error. They're human error. It's when pilots actually take the controls <laughs> that we get into a lot of trouble. But what about Captain Scully? I'm sorry. <laughs> human romanticism in this in this space is huge too. So <laughs> I know. So and the reason, the reason, as John says, it works so well is because we have a stable system and humans mess it up. So it is no general rule here, right? You've got to fit that problem you're trying to solve, what you're trying to solve, or to the environment you're in, and look at the relevant advantages of a machine versus a human, because both make errors. And you're just trying to get a good handle on who is more likely to make what kind of error in this environment. Um, another question from the audience. If Western governments are limited in the extent to which they can gather and share information, but leading AI companies, for example, Google, uh, are not. Is the future of intelligence production in the hands of the private sector? Look at Maxar satellites, right? There is a, there is a, you know, John and I live, we can sleep this stuff. And we couldn't see what you were seeing five years ago, but we can see a chunk of what you're seeing now, Martin, because we have private satellite companies that are flashing up images in real time for us to look at. That's a different world, right? And you're not sharing it with us voluntarily, so a private sector company is doing it and we're not even paying them. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that, that ties, there's another question that's, that's in the queue there was kind of on general open sources in general, um, you know, not just companies, but, you know, are we able to learn things outside of states? Um, again, this is not an AI story. This is a data and information story. I mean, one, one aspect of the war in Ukraine that is so fascinating is like the degree of specificity in the open source world that is available, right? I mean, think of it, what's available to you in your open sources, and it is far more detailed than stuff that I was seeing in Kosovo 20 years ago with, you know, all of the sources behind the green door. I mean, that is amazing, right? So the public is now able to track events. Um, you know, I would think that there are probably many places that the open source intelligence is probably providing 
better information for what's going on on the ground than the Russians themselves have. Um, and I'm sure the Russians, you know, are using that information as well. Um, we know that, you know, the Iranians after Stuxnet, right, benefited tremendously from all of the open source analysis that, that was happening. Um, so, you know, there are lots of interesting ways in which that's going on. Um, but, you know, I mean, like, the, when we see companies or, you know, open source movements replacing what the intelligence community used to do, you know, many decades ago, that doesn't necessarily tell us about what you guys are doing now, right? And your value added is always bringing some kind of private information advantage to bear against that additional context. And hopefully you're bringing in enough of that public information so that you have that context and not getting you know, distracted by secrets. Spies love secrets, right? But you know, we need to be focused more on the picture. Um, you know, so I think I think again the, the overwhelming theme of complementarity comes to the fore again here. So yes, lots of substitution happening, lots of cool stuff going on, but um, there's still a lot we don't know. The outbreak of war is the greatest piece of evidence that there's things that we don't know. If we knew everything that we needed to know, there wouldn't be war in the first place. Right, um, and so you still have to have these kind of ongoing hard analytical processes. I, for me, this is just uh, an endlessly fascinating question, and I think we, I think we really are when you couple it with AI uh, and some of the technologies that are available in the private sector. I think we're at a really nascent stage in terms of governments working with the private sector, and I would include academia in that. And I think we have to do that. Um, and the other part that you alluded to is uh, open source, which is there are cultural barriers within you know, the intelligence community that if it's open source, it's somehow a lesser source. Yeah. Um, and I've never really understood that because they clearly go hand in hand. Uh, and it's one way to confirm things. Uh, you know, if you do have, you know, the more covert or exquisite intel, uh, it's quite often helps one move from something is likely to something is very likely if you confirm that through uh, OSINT sources uh, out there. Well, so, I think it's, it's, it's a also, huge discussion. Sorry, it's also, it's also very interesting, Martin, because you started us off this afternoon by saying the Biden administration did an unprecedented thing. It shared intelligence. That's true. We did that in order to shape the information space. But one of the really interesting things was it's able to do that because there's so much open source intelligence, battlefield intelligence. There's so much stuff available on Russian troop deployments up against the Ukrainian frontier, the risk that it was going to violate <laughs> uh, or, you know, betray or risk betraying a source, much less, because so much of what was released could be confirmed by open source anyway. The certainty could not. The certainty did not. But a lot of the other stuff could be. And that was very helpful to them. Yeah. Well, and one of the things we're seeing, too, in terms of you know, bad actors um, and threats. A lot of the threats are now, um, you know, private sector companies, individuals who may not have much to do with government. And I think, you know, we've got to have a hard look at the obligation there um, to keep people informed. Um, and the more open and transparent you are, um, you know, maybe I'm Pollyannish, but I think it actually gives you the high ground uh, in the long run. So several great questions here. As the world moves towards a world of unique, erratic autocrats that are sole decision makers for their countries, can AI and models really work? Does psychological analysis fit into AI and models? Professor Stein, that's all you. Yeah, I, I will just say as to that question. Then I'm going to have to excuse myself, Martin, because I teach a class at the university. I'm going to have to give myself just enough time to log off and log on. Um, but psychological models, 
are of many varieties. We have a rich literature on general patterns of decision making that are predictable. They're not random, they're predictable. But you know, oh, if you can be at very strong predictive value when you're capturing what two thirds of the population do, but doesn't tell you whether the person you're really interested in studying is among those two thirds or is on the other side, one third. <laughs> And that's the, that, so that is a more is an illustration of the more general problem we all have. Um, predictions uh, or general findings don't give you point predictions that you need. So when you want to know what Vladimir Putin is going to do, there are no general models that really help you answer that with precision. You're fitting together so many different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and you're drawing on multiple sources. And that speaks to the point that you made John earlier. That's where human analysts are, will continue to be absolutely invaluable because it's an understanding of the history, the culture, the context. Um, you know, if people did not read the article that he published last summer, that 7,000 word article, and somebody would have had to read that to fit it into a machine and it would get lost because it would be only 7,000 data points in a 10 million data point collection uh, and it wouldn't get the weight that it deserved. So when we're dealing with point prediction, which is often what we're dealing with in our field um, in international security, um, I think the future for human analysts I think there's a lot of job security, unlike radiologists, for instance, whose job security is much more limited. AI does a really great job on reading mammograms. I, I wonder if I can jump in on this just to kind of tie together some of the themes we've talked about, because I think, you know, Ukraine is all on our minds. And, you know, the intelligence community did a fantastic job assessing what the buildup looked like and the operational intentions to launch, you know, that. But there were kind of two categories where we got things radically wrong. And one was the actual balance of power um, of these two forces. And we radically overestimated the Russians because we didn't understand how bad their doctrine was and how terrible their experience was and how they really weren't able to operate all of this kit that they had, let alone the condition that it was in. And number two, we didn't really appreciate that the Ukrainians went to school for the last seven years and they have learned how to shoot, move, and communicate with a high level of you know, skill and they've got incredible morale and, and, and courage in some really difficult situations. So like, like, again, those magical human factor X on both sides were really, really different than the material balance of power. And that meant you had huge disagreement about the outcome of this war, which we're now in the process of measuring the hard way. And then the other category, and Janice just touched on this, was like, what was this war about, right? And, you know, as security people, we tend to like really think about security and it's this rational progress. So like, do you need a buffer? Are you worried about escalation? Are you worried about NATO? And I think the more we learn, we're like, that's not really what this war was about, right? I mean, this is a war about Russian identity and Russian prestige and status in the international system as it's, you know, a decaying alcoholic power, right? I mean, like, that's a different set of analytical concepts that are now becoming more and more salient because how else do you explain Russian willingness to, you know, completely break their geopolitical future on you know this particular conflict, so um, again, those are deeply, deeply human and strategic questions, and and that's that's the future of AI. Listen, this has been extraordinary for me, and I hope for the people listening. Can I just ask one final thing from each of the professors? Uh, if you could do a little, you know, self-advertisement, where would folks go who are listening if they wanted to learn more about either of your uh, research? What would you suggest? Easiest way is to just find me on the Monk School website. There is an email there, and I would be delighted to hear from all of you. And I'm going to say goodbye because my class is in a minute. So, Martin, thank you so much. And John, who is a valued friend and colleague, thank you.
Bless great. you, Professor. Great, great. And, 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 and the John and Janice show will be uh, touring again in Toronto on Friday if you uh, happen to be around. So at two o'clock at the Monk School. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap it up here and thank, um, well, I'll thank you, John, um, and Janice, uh, who's gone to teach her lucky class. Um, these have been invaluable insights. Um, and I would like to point out that to date, this series has covered a lot of topics that include the basics of AI. Um, and there are several more coming up which I don't have my list, but I think you should go to the Canada School website and look those up. And unless the organizers who've been walking me through this think I have missed something big, um, I'll wish everybody a great day. Great, thank you so much, Martin. Appreciate your hosting us and uh, thanks for inviting me. And this was a lot of fun. Look, look together to meeting or talking to you again. Thank you. All right.